Now, if you would please take your copies of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're going to begin reading at verse 9. The verse that we're going to focus on is verse 16. So you'll be aware of that as we read from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Romans 12 and verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <coughs> Let's pray together and again ask God that he would come and be our help. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who is a shepherd to your people, who provides all of our needs so that we can say, I shall not want you are the shepherd who leads your people into green pastures to feed them and beside the still waters that they might be satisfied. Oh, our God, how we pray that you would come today and feed us from your word, that you would give to us what our souls need. We thank you that you know us intimately. You know where we are in the Christian life. You know what we need to hear. You have sent your spirit to bring your word with power to our hearts. And so we do ask our God that where we need to be convicted, that your spirit would do that through the word. And where we need to be encouraged, that you would indeed lift us up by your spirit through the word. Heavenly Father, please may we leave this place different than what we were when we came because of your work in our lives. And we pray especially, our God, that the ultimate goal would be transformation into the image of the Lord Jesus. Surely, our God, nothing better can happen to us than to be made more like Christ. And so we ask that you would do that today. We believe that will bring glory to your name. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We began our series on the one another's by considering the subject of church membership. I acknowledged at that time that there's no explicit command in the Bible that says you must become a church member. But we were reminded that there are many ways in which God reveals his will to us. For one thing, God's will is often revealed to us through examples that he sets before us in the scriptures. 
we think of the church in Jerusalem, a group of people, thousands of people, who were converted under the preaching of the Apostle Peter, and those people who had come to embrace the Lord Jesus as their Savior were immediately baptized to show their new allegiance to Christ, and then they were added to the number of the church. So they were visibly committing themselves to the life of the local church, to the gatherings for worship, for prayer, and for fellowship. We were also reminded that God's will is revealed to us through the various descriptions he gives us of the church in the New Testament. You can think of many of the pictures or the analogies. The church as a body, similar to a human body, or the church as a building or a nation. And as you think of those entities, a body, a building, a nation, you know that there are individuals that comprise those groups that are united together. So in a human body, there's all kinds of parts, but they don't exist on their own. They exist together. The bricks in a building. You don't come to a building and you've got a pile of bricks in the parking lot. They've all been joined together with mortar and they're standing there together. They're united. The same thing with citizens in a nation. And so God reveals his will for the church by these various pictures he gives us in the New Testament. And then we also considered that God's will is revealed through the clear instructions he gives to his people about how they are to interact with one another. And that is, of course, why we came to consider these one another's in the New Testament, because they reveal to us <clears throat> very clearly a group of Christians who are committed to one another and involved in each other's lives. Thus far, we've looked at how God wants us to view one another, the need to love one another, the call to encourage one another, the necessity of forgiving one another, our spiritual care for one another, the importance of serving one another, accepting one another, and that grace of forbearance, putting up with one another in a godly way. Now this morning we're coming to the last of these one another's that uh, we can identify in the New Testament. There are actually more than nine, but a bunch of them have been sort of subsumed under these titles that we've already considered. So as we come to this ninth subject, we want to think this morning about the commitment to unity, the commitment to unity that God calls us to. Now, while this is presented to us in the Word of God as a separate responsibility, in many ways it underlines all of the things that we have already considered. Because if we are going to carry out these God-given duties that we've been studying from the Word of God, there must be a unity between believers. Unity is that essential bond which ties Christians together in the local church. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. We might say the Spirit's work in our lives, the grace that He brings to us, is like a spiritual glue that brings us and holds us and unites us together. But though unity is essentially a work of the Holy Spirit, it's something that we are called upon by God to work at and maintain. For instance, Paul's familiar words 
to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 4 state this truth plainly. He says that as members of the church, we need to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So church unity is the unity of the spirit. It's something that he manufactures as he unites us together in the Lord Jesus Christ but it's something that we are called to work at. We are to be eager to maintain this unity that the Spirit of God has brought to us. So as we draw this series on the one another's to a close, I want us to consider this essential practice of unity in the life of Christ's church. First of all, the call to unity. Now, if you were noticing, as we read here in Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is giving us a long list of duties in which he is showing how the gospel, the fact that Christ has saved us, how that is to be worked out primarily in the relationships of a Christian church. Everyone who has become a Christian has experienced the grace of God changing them. We need to always remember that being a Christian isn't essentially a decision that we have made, although that's involved, but it is essentially God's work within us, calling us out of the world to himself and changing our lives through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we become his children, we're incorporated into a church, and we're seeking to live out his will. So a Christian is a person who's experienced the grace of God, and so they have new desires, and they have a new ability to live for God. And so with these new desires and this new ability worked in us by the Holy Spirit, Paul now gives us a roadmap. He shows us this is how you must travel through the Christian life. These are the things that you must do. This is how you are to live in order to please God. As we examine all of these responsibilities, we discover that most of them have to do with our relationships in the local church, Christians living together, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian life finds its highest expression in the church of the Lord Jesus as we worship together and receive grace upon grace to go out into the world and bear testimony to the gospel. At the very heart of these instructions, in verse 16, Paul says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Now, different versions read, sometimes be of the same mind toward one another. Paul's words here, pretty clear in the Greek, are more difficult to translate literally into the English. Paul is using a verb here, to think. He's challenging us to think as believers, but in the local church, to think the same things toward one another. Or sometimes it's put to have the same mind, or as the ESV puts it, to live in harmony with one another. There's a basic unity between believers that Paul is exhorting us to in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you turn over, maybe you don't even have to turn over, maybe a page into Romans 15, we have very similar language. Romans 15 and verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. So here Paul takes this same matter of unity among God's people and he turns it into a prayer request because he knows that unity among God's people, a people who are very diverse, 
Some men, some women, some older, some younger, all kinds of different backgrounds, different natural interests. We're here together in the Church of Christ. And it's not natural to us to simply be united together and to have the same mind and to think the same way. And so here in chapter 15, having exhorted the church to harmony, to unity, he now prays for the church that God would come and work among his people and indeed bind them together through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's desire is that the God who is always working in the lives of his people will grant them this harmony, that they would have the same mind, that they would be like-minded in their relationships in Christ Jesus. Now, just think of this description, that we would have the same mind. You could almost say that we would have one mind that we would think the same things. How is that ever gonna happen? Well, in life, every day, we see it happening. For instance, let's say we go to a hockey game. Toronto Maple Leafs, Detroit Red Wings. And so, if you could separate up fans, so here are all the Leaf fans, and here are all the Red Wings fans. What are the Leaf fans thinking? They want the Leafs to win. They've got one mind. What are the Red Wings fans thinking? They want the Red Wings to win. They've got one mind. They're thinking the same way. And that's what Paul is saying to us as Christians in a local church. You're not here to cheer on the Leafs or the Red Wings. You're not here to be behind something going on in the world. You're here for the cause of God and Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of God and the glory of our Savior and the success of the gospel throughout the world. You're to have one mind. You're to think the same things as you gather to worship and serve the Lord Jesus. So it's not such a strange uh, concept for us to think about and understand, but it's something that we need to be aware of, recognize it's a duty that God calls us to, and Paul knows the difficulty of it, and so he prays that this is what would be accomplished among God's people. Now, though we don't have time to survey all of the scriptures, we could turn to passages where God's people are described as having the same mind, the same heart, the same voice, the same spirit. It's a recognition that the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people can accomplish a tremendous unity and we're responsible to maintain it. We're to work at having this same mind and same heart, same voice and purpose. So that's the call to unity. It's part of the one anothering life in the local church. Now that brings us secondly to consider the great example of unity, the great example of unity. You know, I just talked about Leafs fans and Red Wing fans. That's an example of unity, but it's not this great example of unity that we need to motivate us to take up this duty and to work it out. There are surely many reasons why the Church of the Lord Jesus needs to recognize and demonstrate unity, but the greatest reason is because of the example that has been set before us, and it's the example of God himself. So turn with me back to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Gospel of John, chapter 17. 
Here we have our Lord Jesus just getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane where he'll be arrested and put on trial and then taken ultimately to the cross for death. This is his high priestly prayer as he prays for his disciples who are there with him and then looks down through the centuries to think of all of the people who will ultimately believe upon him. So we're just going to break into this prayer in verse 20. John 17 and verse 20. I do not ask for these only, his immediate disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So here's Jesus praying for the church in the future. Everyone who down through the generations of church history will believe upon the Lord Jesus because of the testimony of the apostles. That's every one of us. Why are we trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ today? Because in one way or another, we've heard the message preached by the apostles Peter, Paul, the other men, recorded in Scripture, and that message has come to us, and by the grace of God, we have believed upon the Lord Jesus. So Jesus here is praying for us, the church in the future, all who will trust in Christ because of the message of the apostles. It's a pr prayer that applies to the church in every generation, it certainly speaks to the church universal, but it has its beginnings, this issue of unity in the local church. Jesus wants us to be one. He wants us to be united. And the reason he puts that before us is that he wants our unity to be something that reflects the unity among the members of the Trinity. Those relationships of unity in the Godhead are to be the driving force between the relationships of believers in the church. And so Jesus calls us here at this point to understand his words, to, and in order to understand his words, that we've got to do some careful thinking about God. If, if we're to understand unity and how we're going to live out unity, we've got to think about the Godhead and the unity that is manifested there. So we know that the Bible teaches us we believe in one God who exists eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's obviously not something that we can grasp intellectually. There are really no adequate human analogies to explain it to us. We believe that's true about God because God has told us in his word, this is who he is. One God dwelling eternally in three persons. Now, as we research in the scriptures, this truth about God, what he's told us about himself, we discover that one of the things that is true about the Trinity is that their relationships are marked by an incredible unity. Jesus tells us about it here very briefly in his prayer. A unity that is so essential to their relationships that Jesus can speak of the Father being in him, and he in turn is in the Father. Their lives are so united that that language can be used to describe their relationship. Now, the closest reality that we have of that in the human sphere is marriage. The union of a man and a woman in a covenant relationship before God. You're familiar with the story of Genesis 2, of God creating Adam and then God creating Eve and bringing them together in the first marriage relationship. 
And he declares them, having joined them together, that they are one flesh. Now that obviously speaks to their physical relationship. But being one flesh is more than just a biological reality. It speaks of two people whose lives are being forged together. They're growing together in their thinking as they live out their lives together. They're growing together in their purpose, their goals. Their lives manifest a glorious unity. Now that's something that we see in God. And there are many examples of it in the Word of God. Think of how the Bible speaks of the work of God in creation. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here's a statement that points specifically to God the Father executing His will for the creation as it exists. But combine that with the famous statement of John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So in our picture of creation, we see God the Father executing His holy will, creating the heavens and the earth, but now we add to that picture God the Son involved in this work of creation, nothing being made apart from His involvement. So God the Son joining God the Father in the making of this incredible universe. And to that we add the comment of Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so here's the Spirit of God joining in this creative activity to make this wonderful world. What's it a picture of? Unity in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all working together to create this beautiful world that displays the glory of God. We could think about God's work in salvation and see it in the same way, a wonderful display of unity. Let's picture God back in eternity before the world is created and what we call the councils of eternity. So using human language and analogy, we say God the Father calls a planning meeting. And so the members of the Trinity come together, they're sitting around the boardroom table, so to speak, and God the Father lays out before the Son and the Holy Spirit His plan of salvation. Out of the mass of sinful humanity, He has chosen a people that He wants to save, a people who are going to belong to Him. And as part of that plan, he says now to the Son, you must go and become the Savior. You must go and become a man. You must be willing to lay down your life to pay for the sins of these people that I have chosen. And the Son, hearing that message, says, I'm in agreement. I will do that. I'll gladly go and take up this work and save people. But then there's a work for the Holy Spirit to do as well. And so God the Father outlines what the Spirit must do. When Jesus dies on the cross and then rises from the, the grave and ascends back to heaven, those people chosen by the Father aren't actually saved yet. So the Holy Spirit has to come into this world and he has to chase down sinners. And he has to take the work of the uh, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has to apply that to these sinners so that they're called, 
They're regenerated, they're made alive, they're given new life in Jesus Christ, their lives are changed. And the Holy Spirit says, I'll do it. I'll go into this world full of sinners, a grievous place, and I'll take the work that the Son accomplishes it, and I'll apply it to those whom you have chosen, and they will be saved. What is that? It's a glorious demonstration of unity. In the eternal councils, you don't have the Son speaking up and saying, wait a minute, that seems too difficult to me. How come I have to go? How come I have to become a man? How come I have to die on the cross? You don't hear that. The Father says, this is the plan. The Son says, I'll do it. I'll go. I'll lay down my life. You don't have the Spirit saying, wait a minute. You want me to go and enter into the hearts of sinful people? I'm the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do that. No, that's not what you hear. You have the Holy Spirit saying, yes, I'll do that. And you see him doing it through the pages of script, Scripture and down through churches. What is that? It's unity in the Trinity. And Jesus says in his prayer here, Father, I'm praying that my people will be one just as we are one. And so as we take up this responsibility of unity among God's people, just think of what it's saying. We are called to reflect God. This isn't something like just trying to be like the Leafs fans having the same mind. We're called to be like God, like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in their holy, sacred relationships. Jesus is praying for us that we will reflect the life of God in our lives together. So, this kind of unity can never be accomplished by a loose association, but only by people who are prepared to commit themselves to one another in this relationship that we call church membership. Now that brings us secondly, or thirdly and finally, we've thought about the call to unity and this great example of God set before us, this is what unity is to look like. So thirdly, some practical applications. How do we work out our unity? How, how do we practically manifest it uh, day after day as we gather together on the Lord's Day and then through the week praying together, Bible studies together, spending time informally together. How do we uh, practically work out this unity? Well, we don't have a lot of time and this could become a whole sermon series, so I'm just going to be suggestive on two points and then spend a little bit more time on a third point, but there will be lots more for us just to think about. First of all, this reminds us about the importance of our confession of faith. The Bible shows us that fundamentally, our unity is a unity in truth, the truth of God. It's the truth that God has taught us in his word that binds us together. And again, Paul's words in Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There are basic fundamental truths that unite the people of God together in the things that we believe. So as we come together on the Lord's Day or we're meeting for another meeting or just informally or we go to a men's conference together like we did yesterday, 
we're not debating, you know, do we believe in God? Do we believe in a Trinitarian God? Do, do we believe in the deity of Jesus Christ? Those things are settled matters. You know, our confession speaks of what we believe about God, what we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ, what we believe about salvation, how God saves a sinner. We're not here to debate whether salvation is the work of God or whether it's our work. Those things have been settled by careful study out of the Word of God. Those are truths that bind us together. I'm always thankful when I meet a Christian out in the world that obviously loves the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's something of a discomfort in my heart and something of a pain when I hear them talking about salvation being a work of man. We believe this is the work of God. This is God coming to sinners who don't deserve it and who are opposed to it. And he turns us around and he brings us to Jesus Christ and he causes us by grace to bow the knee in repentance and faith and we're born again. God does a great work in our lives. Those truths bind us together. Truths about the church, truths about the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We don't come together to debate those things. Those are established truths. And when those things are in our minds, that when we're thinking those things together, that is one of the tools that God uses to bring about a wonderful unity. I was telling the people in Sunday school that on Thursday I was in a meeting at Leamington Hospital. They're reviving their spiritual care committee and invited you know, people from all kinds of different churches and, and faith groups, they call them. And I ended up sitting at the table with a person who denies the deity of Jesus Christ, denies the Bible, practically denies everything that we believe. I, I don't even know why they still call themselves a church. I, I felt no union with that person at all. In fact, I sat there thinking, I think I'm sitting at a table with an enemy of the gospel. But we don't come together like that. We come together with this joint confession of the Bible, of God, of Christ, of salvation, of the church, of worship, of what God wants us to do to serve him. And so we must seek to remain true to that confession, which points us back over and over again to the Bible, these truths that bind us together. So practically, as we work these things out, we must hold on to truth. But a second thing that is really demanded in terms of the expression of unity, we must continue to hold on to regenerate church membership. Because unity isn't simply believing the same things. That's important, that's critical. But unity is also about those truths that God has given us in his word impacting your life and changing you. In other words, we believe that the church of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ is a group of people who have been saved by the grace of God. God has come to us wandering sinners, people who were walking that broad road that leads to destruction, and if God had left us there, we would have finally been cast into hell. We know that's what we deserve. But the Holy Spirit, while we were on that road, chased us down, and he claimed us for the Lord Jesus Christ. He took us out of the world. He brought us to be united to the Lord Jesus and we have that common experience in the church. And that common experience binds us to one another. 
So when we have opportunity to receive a new member into the church, whether they've just been converted and are about to be baptized or whether they were converted before and have already been baptized but they want to join the church and they give their testimony and they talk about how God has worked in their heart and has brought them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not sitting there thinking, wow, that's strange. How, how did that ever happen? We're sitting there saying in our heart, amen, I know that to be true because that's what happened to me. God has worked in my heart and I hear the work of God in this person's heart. And so immediately there's this connection. And so we must continue to hold to regenerate church membership. Not anybody who walks in the door can become a church member. Now everyone is welcome. I would rejoice to see anyone walk through that door. To join with us here, to listen, participate in the worship of God, to receive the benefit of other people. But if you're going to join this church, you have to know Jesus Christ. You have to know that you are a sinner. You have to be willing to come to God acknowledging that and ask Jesus to save you because that is a matter of unity in the local church. The third thing, and we'll just spend a little bit more time here as we seek to live out this unity to, to put feet on it, we might say, to make it practical in our lives. There has to be a willingness to confront what I would call, many have called it the same thing, crass individualism. Yesterday at the men's conference, we heard a little bit about that. I didn't know that was going to come up. But this is something that we have to confront in our own lives, a crass individualism. What is that? It's a reliance upon yourself. It's making self the center of your existence. It's making decisions in life that center on self and really nobody else, forgetting everybody else around you. That's destructive of unity. That will never pull people together. That always tears people apart. That's what tears marriages and families apart. When people can only think about themselves and my benefit and what I want, rather than thinking about the other people who might be involved in your lives. As you know, we are living in the me generation. It's the generation where we're told by speakers, by songwriters, it comes into our ears from so many sources. Just follow your heart. Just listen to yourself. Just allow that to control your thinking and let your own heart make the decisions for you and you'll never be wrong. Well, they don't have a biblical understanding of what the heart is, that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you don't want to trust that. And then Paul's words here in Ephesians 12, 16, at the end of the verse, never be wise in your own sight. Never be wise in your own sight. And Proverbs reminds us that the one who trusts in himself and his own heart is a fool. God tells us over and over again, don't trust yourself. You need the church. So becoming a church member, there has to be a willingness to reject this kind of crass individualism. Now, just like Pastor Dunn said yesterday, as we become part of the people of God, we don't lose our individual identity. You will never look just like me. I will never look just like you. And you're probably thankful for that. But 
as we come together, there are many things with regards to this individualism that we must reject. Let me tell you just, you know, one very personal thing that I, I, I think makes it understandable. I'm not trying to make myself the example, but it's just, you know, how I try and live this out. I'm getting ready to go on vacation. Well, Kathy and I, Lord willing, will be gone for three weeks. And we don't just come to this time and say, okay, you know, in my contract with the church, I've got these weeks off, so, you know, these are the weeks, and, and we're taking off, you know, go bye, we'll see you when we get there. When I plan, I try to think about the church. Because I know not that the church is dependent upon me, not that the church isn't going to go forward if I'm not here, but I know that my being, not being here has an impact. And so I've got to think about, okay, you know, I want to make sure that in the pulpit, in the Sunday school, there's, there's going to be good ministry. So that it's not like I'm gone and, you know, you're coming together and, and you're not getting to No. And, you know, I, I've got to think about, okay, you know, we're a small group, so I know people are going on vacation at different times. I want to choose when other people are wary because then we'll be a really, really small group and it'll be difficult. I'm just trying to tell you that in the church, we've got to put away this individualism that only thinks about me, and we've got to start thinking about one another. How is the decisions that I make about my life individually going to impact the church? That's rejecting crass individualism and taking up Paul's words here, never be wise in your own sight. What happens, for instance, when you feel some disagreement, some tension between yourself and someone else in the church? Do you begin by considering, well, I must be right and this other person is wrong? Or do you say to them, well, you know, we, we're obviously disagreeing here. Can we sit down with our Bibles and just talk about it? Those disagreements are gonna come. They're, they're always going to be there in the life of the church some tensions between God's people. You can't just ignore them. Lifting up the proverbial corner of the carpet and sweeping them underneath isn't going to solve anything. We have to be willing to go to the Word of God and say, you know, we say we believe the same things. We say we believe we've got the same practice. How, how are we going to work this out? How are we going to walk together in unity and in love? John Owen practically says, carefully watch yourself for the first motion of strife. Is there anything troubling between you and a fellow believer? That first motion of strife, anything, any, any little word, any little offense where maybe you, you feel uncomfortable or, or there's something there, or just, uh, you know, you feel funny about something. He says, watch yourself and quickly seek the removal of the first appearance of division. If there's something that's grown up between you and a brother or a sister, you've got to work quickly to get rid of that. He says, strike at the root of all dissension by laboring for universal conformity to Jesus Christ. Oh, how the life of the church would be so much different if we would be decommitted to following up those things. The problem? Okay, let's deal with it. Let, let's get it behind it. Let's, let's solve this. Let's make sure that we're walking together in universal conformity to Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful way to put it. In other words, in everything about our lives, 
conform to the Lord Jesus, following him, seeking to do his will. So the one another's of the New Testament. We've studied them. Are they just in the past? Or are we keeping them in front of our minds and seeking to live them out? Do we love this truth that God has given to us? Do we love this experience of grace that God has given to us? And are we determined to work it out practically? Just as we close this time together, I would again say, if you're here and you're not a church member, let me ask you, why not? You know, are you convinced of these things? Do you see that God has shown us in various ways that we need to be committed to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have the experience required? Have you come to Jesus Christ for salvation? Do you know the life-changing work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life? All of these things can be had freely just by going to God and praying and asking Him to do this work in your lives. Oh, that we might be a church that Maybe it's not written on the walls, but when people come in, they know that we're committed to the one another's. Let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that you have laid before us. Our God, how do we accomplish such a great thing? To have a unity that is like the unity in the Godhead. We know that we need your grace to accomplish these things. We'll never accomplish them on our own. Please, will you come to us and help us? Will you strengthen us? Will you pour out your Spirit upon us and grace with him? that more and more, week by week, we would be conformed to the image of Christ. And our God, that it might all be to your honor and glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.